history, I, I will deal here, try to deal a little bit with history here. And I think this is important because a lot of us are very ignorant about Russian history. Uh, we study the Russian Revolution quite a bit, but uh, and even maybe the bit that comes immediately after, but very rarely do we actually discuss the period that comes at the very end of this process, uh, the dissolution of USSR and how it took place, and whether it was inevitable is maybe another question that needs to be raised as well. Typically historians would say that the interest the history should be studied in order to understand why something happens. We shouldn't study, uh, it's not an interesting question to ask why so, if something could have happened differently. Uh, but I think for our point of view, we want to understand, yes, why something happened, but also if there was an alternative uh, and why that alternative was not posed, if it did exist. And so that's what I'm trying to kind of try to explain. Um, and I think also in order to understand Russian society today and the regime that Putin uh, is, or the people around him, uh, to understand Russia today you really have to understand uh, how the, so the USSR, the Soviet Union, how it collapsed uh, and how Putin came to power, because that really uh, explains quite a lot of the dynamics of that regime also today. Um, because it is not like a regime in the West, uh, as you probably have noticed yourself. Um, so uh, we'll have to start, I'm afraid, in 1917 uh, with the Russian Revolution, because this was, what, after all, what created the Soviet Union. And the Russian Revolution, it raised the hopes of uh, millions, hundreds of millions of workers all around the world and poor and oppressed. And it was like a beacon uh, for the world revolution or for the whole of the world. Uh, proletariat of that actually workers could not just fight for power, they could actually take power and they could hold on to it. And that's what they did. Uh, the Paris Commune, they took power, but they, they were, failed to hold on to it except for a few months. And here is the first time the workers took power and held on to it. Um, we can discuss exactly how long they held on to it, but for some time anyway, for some years. Um, they were faced with uh, not insurmountable obstacles, but a tre tremendous opposition from internally, from the sabotage, from the old ruling class, but also they were invaded by 21 armies. They had a country, they inherited a country that was devastated by war. But in spite of this, uh, the workers, they rebuilt the country and by the time of 1941, uh, when Germany invaded, they did not just uh, defend themselves against Hitler's armies, but they actually fought them back and defeated Hitler. And if you look at the statistics of uh, casualties and uh, amount of tanks destroyed and whatnot, you'll find that this on the Eastern Front, as it's called in Europe, that Hitler was defeated and not uh, at D-Day or something like that, which is, or in Africa, which the British probably would like to think. Um, we, um, but this period here, when we talk about the period from 1921 to 1941, it, it's something else happened, which was of much more tragic character, which was that the working class was dispossessed of its political power. It lost control of a state apparatus, which it had taken, the new worker state, and lost control of this worker state to the state bureaucracy. And this consisted, this bureaucracy consisted not of the revolutionaries of 1917 or uh, 1905, but of the old Mensheviks who had opposed revolution and the Tsarist officials uh, and uh, so on, and also been opposed to revolution, all kinds of cadets and liberals and so on. They formed the new, uh, they became part of the state machinery and also became the members of the Communist Party. Uh, and this was a deliberate policy on the part of Stalin to get these people into the party. And they diluted the revolutionary constant part. Combine that with the defeat of the uh, international revolution uh, and the economic hardships that existed at the time, it meant where well, the workers had to work really long hours and weren't able to participate in the running of society. This uh, was a uh, defeat of the workers, so they lost control of the state. Instead, you have this bureaucratic caste which develops all kinds of uh, privileges. So, for example, they had special shops for party members, and the top bureaucrats had themselves special shops just for the top bureaucrats. And this kind of situation where you had this, where party membership was not something you sacrificed for, you, uh, something you fought for, uh, and something where the most politically conscious workers were involved, but rather it was where the it was a 
a, a career ladder, basically, a bit like uh, the Labour Party is today, if you want a comparison, but slightly different, obviously. It's like the Labour Party and the Tory Party put together, maybe. Um, but still, they managed this growth rate in the 1920s and 30s. In the 30s, reached about 6%, so it was a substantial growth of the economy. Um, they recovered after the war in the 1940s. Uh, it was a massive disaster economically, but they recovered. And, by the and they had a steady growth throughout the 50s and the 60s, around 6%, which is, you know, is what the best or what the capitalist countries achieved at the same time. And that was the height of the capitalist boom. But then, then uh, things took a turn for the worse uh, in the 1970s. And this is something we have to uh, try to understand as well. Now, Trotsky said that uh, the planned economy needs uh, democracy like the body needs oxygen. Another uh, analogy might be that the uh, planned economy needs democracy like, machiner like oil, machinery needs oil. You can run a machinery without oil, but eventually it will break down out of all the friction and damage that's caused by the machinery. And this is what basically what takes place. Uh, by the time of the 1970s, the whole economy started to ground to a halt. You still have growth, but it's very limited. So in the 50s and 60s, if you're living in the Soviet Union, you would find every year the things were improving. You'd get better housing, more, you know, commodities. Things weren't great. You had a tremendous political oppression, of course, but things seemed to be a little bit improving every year. But by the time of the 70s, this starts to change. And when you come to the 80s, uh, the economy basically starts to stagnate. And this is... Um, and the reason for this is that bureaucracy doesn't really have any interest in developing the economy itself. They're interested in develop, just maintaining their privileges. And uh, they're incapable of allocating resources in a balanced way. And you can see the complexity of an economy and resource allocation. If you look at the economy today, all well, the so-called bottlenecks they talk about. Yeah? And you find the bureaucrats, of, they run the factories and the industries, they, they, they will do what they're told, but they won't really do, they would just do what they're told and nothing else, right? So they were told to produce shoes, they didn't have enough resources to produce both left and right shoes, so they just produced left shoes. Um, because it was quicker, because they didn't have to change over the machinery, right? To produce right shoes, so they just produced left shoes for one year, and the next year they produced right shoes. I mean, this kind of absurdities, right? Which make no sense in any kind of situation, but under the specific of the bureauc bureaucratic cloud economy, uh, that, that kind of made sense. You know, in the, in the, and you know, they had technically fulfilled what was asked for them, which was produce X number of shoes, right? They wouldn't ask to produce pairs of shoes, they would ask to produce shoes. So they did that. Another example is the one ton nail, which famously was produced. It was, they, were produ they were asked to produce one ton of nails, yeah, but they didn't have the resources to produce one ton of nails, so instead they produced a one ton nail, which is obviously completely useless, uh, but they did fulfill the quota. And the quality of the products got worse, the worse, the closer they got to the consumer. And it got to the point where about half the clothes that reached the shops had to be discarded because they were of so poor quality. And the solution to this, obviously the bureaucrats didn't have to suffer these problems. They had their own shops where different quality of clothes and so on were sold. And they also import, uh, bought, uh, were able to access Western imports, imported goods from the West. So they had luxury clothes, they had mink coats, they had uh, uh, watches, jewelry, all the trappings basically were bourgeois in the West, they had access to uh, through uh, their special shops and special privileges as well as corruption. And the solution to this problem was workers' control, but the bureaucracy couldn't accept this. The first thing that would have been questioned in an open democratic discussion, and it was actually questioned multiple times whenever they started having these debates, would have been the privileges of the bureaucracy. And this started to be happening in, in earnest in the 1980s. This group, the bureaucracy of the state, was a parasitic caste. It didn't really play any progressive role whatsoever. Even the capitalists in our society, they take a big profit, they get a good chunk of the surplus value of the workers, but they reinvest at least some of it. But these guys, they were completely parasitic. They weren't reinvesting any of the money. They were just consuming it, basically. They were just piling it up in luxury cars or whatever. They weren't really playing a progressive role in the economy.
and, the, um, and they were a barrier, merely a barrier to the future development of the society. They were actually an obstacle to the development of the economy, development of workers' control, development of socialism. And the more of a barrier they became, the more corrupt they became. As they lost confidence in socialism, as they saw it, uh, that is the bureaucratically planned economy, the more corrupt they became, the more they started filling their own pockets instead of uh, attempting to solve the problems. And the worst got towards the end, to, in the early 1980s, the worst was the new generation that was born at that time, or the, born in the 70s, who were uh, completely born parasites and they had no outlook other than to be parasites. If you look at some of the bourgeois, the children are very, very rich in Western society. You have a very similar phenomenon. All they can do is go and sit on yacht, yachts and go to nightclubs and that's all they're capable of doing really and take lots of drugs. Um, but this was the kind of people that were developing in Russia at that time, the young generation. Um, Ted Grant, in the book Russia from Revolution to Counter-Revolution, which is an excellent book that explains the whole of the period which I've just gone through in very, very quickly, um, he says, the ruling elite fell more and more under the influence of capitalism, the more and more they fell... Uh, sorry. The ruling elite fell more and more under the influence of capitalism, the more alienated they became from Soviet society. So the less they were living among the workers in a sense, they were living off in some villas and so on in the fancy seaside resorts, the more separate they became from workers, the more attracted they became to capitalism. Um, Gorbachev came to power in the early 1980s, kind of by accident, but accident expresses necessity, as we say. He represents an attempt by the bureaucracy to try to solve these problems by a mess or measure of reform. So he spoke about workers' control and democracy, and many social democrats in the West thought that, oh, here we go, here's someone who's trying to introduce democracy and solve the problems. Actually, there's some other people as well, but anyway, he made noises like this. But you could never implement workers' control or democracy in uh, this, the planned economy without actually uh, having a political revolution overthrowing the bureaucracy, was controlling everything, right? So this is the fundamental problem. What would have need, be needed was a political revolution, but this was obviously not something neither Gorbachev nor the rest of his compadres at the top of the bureaucracy were prepared to do. Um, it, it really was a choice between, on the one hand, workers' control, socialism, a road to socialism, on the one hand, or, on the other hand, it was capitalism. And for the, in the early stages, this was not clear to the bureaucracy. They didn't understand that they had this choice in front of them. It was, they were kind of fumbling, trying to resolve problems, doing whatever they could, going from one thing, to trying one thing, then the other, in order to try to resolve the problems. But they didn't have a conscious idea where they were going with this. Um, um, the fundamental flaw in Gorbachev's position was to encourage greater initiative and therefore greater productivity from the workers while simultaneously defending the privileges and perks of the bureaucracy was an attempt to square the circle. So that's another quote from Ted Grant's book. Uh, and what they, what, so basically he was trying to square the circle, defend the bureaucracy, attack the bureaucracy at the same time, talking about workers' control where it's actually not implemented in practice. Uh, what he said was, we are fully restoring the principle of socialism from each according to his ability to each according to his work. That's what Gorbachev said. Now, for those of you who feel like, mm, wasn't that quite, wasn't, that's not quite what it's supposed to be, right? It's supposed to be to each according to their needs, yeah? But they changed, they had changed this little phrase because if you say to each according to his work, it becomes like these uh, university vice chancellors who are uh, defending their salaries, basically. They say, oh no, because we, do so, we have so much responsibility, right? We're so important. That's why we need to have these privileges, right? So they're claiming basically bureaucracy was fulfilling some kind of essential function, which is completely wrong. A, uh, they were, would have been entitled to what Marx called the wages of superintendence, but uh, let's not go into that. But anyway, the, obviously you have the would have, some of these roles are necessary, like managing and so on. But this is not these kind of privileges had nothing to do with what was necessary and everything to do with a caste trying to defend its own privileges against the workers and living off the backs of the workers.
And this, this thing was basically an ideological re justification for the privileges of the bureaucracy. Now, the reforms they introduced led to temporary improvement in the economy for about one year, but then things quickly turned for the worse. Workers' conditions were worsened, they were asked to work longer hours and work harder. They introduced management models from the West in order to try to get more product squeeze more productivity out of workers. But at the same time, the bureaucratic mismanagement and the corruption got a lot worse. I'll give a hair-raising example in a minute. Black market became, the black market became the main source of goods and raw materials. So the shops had to get their goods, not from the official channels, but they had to go to the black market in order to get the goods they can sell in the shops. And the same goes for industries, which had to buy the raw materials for their production on the black market, because nothing was coming through for the official channels. Um, and this is obviously completely unsustainable. By 1990, 70 million were living on the breadline. And at this point, only 15 to 20 percent of uh, the Russian population said that they, or Soviet population, said they believed in socialism, which gives you some idea of the kind of demoralization that was taking place. But at the same time, only 25% wanted a market-oriented system. So it was a lot of confusion, basically. The move towards capitalism wasn't popular. And even at that stage, 40% favored a return to more centralized economic management. Um, but the bureaucracy, unlike the, if the population was confused, the bureaucracy was uh, starting to become clear about what they wanted. And they had lost all faith in themselves and their ability to run the economy and was rather looking towards the West and capitalism as the solution. <laughs> As Trotsky said, they were trying to secure their position and that of their children by turning themselves into capitalists. That's the way Trotsky forecast that uh, things would develop in the Soviet Union. And with some delay of a few decades, it did actually happen. And so they began a program of austerity and deregulation. And this was on, on the Gorbachev, but now in different characters. You have this, you start, you know, basically you start to become a split in the bureaucracy at this point. Um, and Yeltsin is, became the leader of the pro-capitalist wing. Um, he had a flair for gestures. Uh, he was a bit of a populist, as they would say today. He uh, didn't use his limousine when going to state, or he dispensed with his limousine sometimes and appeared in a normal car. He would visit markets, talk to people, obviously always making sure that the TV cameras were following when he was doing this. He denounced the privileges of bureaucracy. Uh, and he, he was uh, a demagogue, basically. He, you know, make a lot of noise, but didn't really have any proper solutions. In fact, when he was running Moscow, he started closing down the black market. Very good, you think. But there is a slight problem with that. If you close down the black market, but all the shops and all the industries are getting their products from the black market, then what's going to happen? So you just make the situation even worse. You're not actually solving the problem. You're just making a superficial attempt, which failed. But he, he emerged in, uh, as a big player in 1990. And at this point, the GOS plan, which was the planning department, uh, they were warning of a complete collapse in the economy. And Gorbachev, at this time, he was vacillating. He was leaning, the, the, on the one hand, on the hardliners, as they were called, the people who were resisting the restoration of capitalism, and on the other hand, the pro-market people, the pro-capitalist people, uh, like Yeltsin. And he was balancing between these two factions, sometimes leaning on one again to strike against the other, the, the other, so leaning on the pro-capitalists to strike against the hardliners, sometimes leaning on the hardliners to strike against the pro-capitalists. Um, Yeltsin, however, was impatiently wanting to press ahead with the, what they called reforms, right? At this point, you have the disintegration of the Soviet Union be, be, happened in earnest. Uh, all the different countries of the Baltic states and so on would declare their independence. The Warsaw Pact had been wound up in 1989, I think it was. Um, and Yeltsin used his position as chairman of the Ru chairman of the Russian Supreme Soviet. So remember, there's Russia and there's the Soviet Union. Russia is part of the Soviet Union, yeah. Uh, but there are many other there are other republics in the Soviet Union. But he was the chair of the Russian Supreme Soviet, and he used that to, this chaos or this constitutional crisis in order to increase his own powers as being the head of the Russian Supreme Soviet. 
uh, and the situation was slipping out of Gorbachev's control. Now he began, he tried uh, to stabilize the situation by, by negotiating what they would call the new union treaty, which was to be a new treaty for the management of the Soviet Union, uh, which basically was a dis dissolving the Soviet Union. Not completely, but there was very limited powers that would still rest with the central uh, leadership and lots would be devolved, as they say. Um, and this was a red flag to the hardliners who were absolutely adamantly opposed to the, this uh, movement. They were against the dissolution of the Warsaw Pact, but they acquiesced to it. But now the Soviet Union was being dissolved, basically, and they were completely opposed. And so they launched a coup against, uh, well, basically against the new Union Treaty, against the ratification of it. Um, Gorbachev was put under house arrest. Uh, but he refused to resign, which was probably a miscalculation on the part of the hardliners, but they didn't seem to know what they were doing, really. Yeltsin evaded capture. He, they had surrounded his villa, but somehow he managed to escape. It's not quite clear how. He barricaded himself then in the White House, which the White House is not the residence of the presidency, but the residence is the place where the parliament meets in, in Russia at that time. Um, the, Russia, the White House in Moscow. And he made an appeal to the masses, saying, right, I have to defend uh, democracy, or I can't remember exactly what he was wanting to defend, but anyway, um, against the coup and so on. And actually, he had some echo. About 10,000 people turned up to the White House to defend the White House from uh, the coup makers. But these people were mainly petty bourgeois in character. So they were people who basically were looking towards capitalism and seeing the advantages that this would bring to them personally. Uh, the coup makers attempted to assault the White House, but after only a few casualties, deaths, uh, like three or something, they pulled back. And this just shows a complete lack of resolution. If you look at Sudan, for example, right now, where there's been a military coup, they're not going to pull back because a few people get killed, right? They're just going to go steam, steamroll ahead. It's not a few deaths that are going to stop them. Uh, but these coup makers lack that kind of resolution. And when, as soon as they pulled back from the siege of the White House, the whole thing unraveled, and within 24 hours, the coup makers were imprisoned or arrested. Um, and this reflected, this uselessness or lack of determination reflected that the leaders of the coup didn't really have confidence in themselves. They didn't have confidence in the alternative. What they were fighting for essentially was the failed status quo. They weren't fighting for the workers' democracy or workers' control or socialism. They were fighting for the failed status quo. So obviously, there wasn't really much. How are you going to you know, make people enthusiastic about that? Um, but the result of this was that the hardliners were routed. Uh, and, and this also meant that Gorbachev was finished. Because his whole, the way he had kept himself afloat was by leaning one against the other. But now suddenly, with the hardliners gone, all that remained was the pro-capitalist faction. Yeah, the Soviet Union was dissolved completely. And with that, also Gorbachev's presidency. He was president of the Soviet Union, right? Instead, Yeltsin stepped forward as the leader of the reconstitution Ru Russian Federation. So now we have the Russian Federation, and henceforth it's Russia, not the Soviet Union. Yeltsin and his faction were confident. They suspended the Communist Party of the Soviet Union on the 29th of August, which is the day after the collapse of the coup. He, they seized all the assets of the party, they banned the party on the 6th of November, November and they granted emergency power, the parliament granted emergency power to Yeltsin to carry out reforms. Now, how did this take place? Well, the absence of the workers is the key part in this equation. There was not really any particular strength of the Yeltsin faction, 10,000 in a country of 150 million, is it? Oh, there's more. Uh, anyway, it's not that big, yeah? It's not that much in the grand scheme of things. Uh, Yeltsin called for a general strike, and although Margaret Thatcher backed the general call for a general strike, uh, he didn't actually get many workers to participate in it. There were some, but not, not many, many. Instead, the battle took place between a confident pro-capitalist wing, who had the backing of the West. All the papers in the West loved Yeltsin uh, throughout the 90s. They had no plan, uh, sorry, and the other side were demoralized, didn't know what they were fighting for, they had no plan, and they were, uh, as I said, defending a status quo which no one believed in. But this wasn't the end of the story. 
Yeltsin now faced opposition in parliament uh, to, the, to the continuation of, the, of the, his ref so-called reforms. The, in fact, the reforms have only made the situation worse. Inflation stood at 2,400% at the end of 1992, which is quite remarkable. You know, that, now they talk about 6% and they're like, oh, we've got high inflation. Well, 2,400% is a bit more. Um, and they had the worst of all worlds, bureaucratic mismanagement as well as crony capitalism. Wages were not being paid, industries were standing still, they were mass processed, and these actually led to Yeltsin having to uh, uh, give a number of concessions and roll back, cover his reform and sack his Minister of Finance, who was particularly odious. Uh, Yeltsin in his memoir stated that he wanted to make reform, i.e. the transition to capitalism, irre irreversible, and that was his aim. Um, but in order to do that, he had to get rid of Congress or Parliament, which was resisting his measures. So they needed to grant Yeltsin dictatorial powers, and Congress was refusing to do that. 1992 was spent triangling over a new constitution, and, and Congress and Yeltsin couldn't agree. March 1993, Yeltsin attempted to rule by decree, i.e. dispense with Parliament, just rule by decree. But he was blocked by the Constitutional Court and he faced impeachment, although he narrowly escaped impeachment. Instead, they went for a referendum. And referendum, if you know something about Bonapartism, I'll return to the question. Referendums is a typical method by which someone, you know, one person can rule uh, by, uh, by you, the use of referendums. It's, it's a way of a one person rule, you could say, it's a method of that. And he uh, launched a referendum for a new constitution without actually having written the constitution. So it was a referendum about having a new constitution without having actually written it. And it was narrowly won by Yeltsin with the support of the West, who granted him some extra money just, at the, just a month before the referendum took place. There was also quite a bit of vote rigging as this, uh, and um, uh, what they call pork barrel. Uh, that is, uh, Yeltsin offered all kinds of nice things, uh, increasing minimum wage, increasing pensions, or if people would just vote for his new constitution. And they did uh, narrowly, as I said, or at least with some vote reading, they managed to get a narrow majority. Uh, by September then, he suspended Congress, wrote a new constitution himself and his cronies, and then uh, Congress voted to impeach him. Uh, so now there was a showdown basically between Congress, which had been elected a couple of years earlier, and Yeltsin, who was the president. And imperialism stood wholeheartedly behind Yeltsin, uh, calling him a democrat, whereas in fact he was the one who was basically doing a one-man rule, trying to dissolve parliament uh, as a president uh, and write a new constitution on its own. But that didn't really bother the West, because what we were interested in was democracy, i.e. capitalism. Right? They were interested in the return to capitalism. Just like Yeltsin, they wanted to make the return to capitalism irreversible. So Congress, the hardliners, we can call them that again, they ensconced themselves in the White House, again the White House, and this is a bit confusing because there's twice a siege of the White House, which confuses a lot of people, including myself, before I got the hang of it. Um, and uh, Yeltsin then has to try to see, uh, he has to try to seize the White House. Uh, and this wasn't very easy because he went to his generals and he said, look, the, your president demands that you seize the White House. And they were like, yeah, 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 okay, okay. And they basically did nothing. And then he said, are you refusing to follow the orders of the president? This is all from his memoirs. And they were like, mm, no, 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 no. Basically, no one wanted to do anything. So what he had to do was to get uh, uh, some millions of dollars and he had to bribe certain army officers in order to lead this thing. And he managed to cobble together a force of some a couple of thousand or so, out of an army of two and a half million. So a couple of thousand soldiers he managed to cobble together, and some of these would have been in, uh, KGB agents, some of them soldiers, some of them interior ministry people. Uh, anyway, it was a, co it's a bit of hodgepodge. And they managed to assault parliament. Obviously, parliament didn't have an army of, or didn't have any soldiers of their own, uh, and so uh, they fell. The, the hardliners did attempt to um, make a counter coup or try to appeal to the masses, but it was a bit half hearted. There were some workers who turned up to defend Parliament, but it was relatively limited in the grand scheme of things. Again, 10, 20, 30,000, something like that. But the defeat of Parliament created a powerful impetus for the capitalist restoration. 
And Yeltsin banned opposition parties, he banned newspapers, he suspended local councils, he sacked councillors and governors of the provinces, he suspended the constitutional court, uh, all of course in the name of democracy. But none of these questions actually solved the economic problems. Uh, in 1989, the economy was worth $1.46 trillion. Um, this is doing like that much, but in those current states, uh, money. By 1998, it was worth $800 billion. So it's a fall of 44% in the space of nine years. Uh, it was an unmitigated disaster. Uh, the resolution to uh, the solution of the West was more shock, more therapy. If you remember the way they call it, it was shock therapy, right? So the Financial Times had a headline in the middle of it saying more shock, more therapy. And this was the solution of the West, basically uh, starved them into capitalism. Yeltsin obliged, and it, it, at the same time he lined his, the pockets of himself and his cronies in the process. Uh, and some of this was recent, has been in court over the last decade in the UK, where all these kind of dodgy dealings that went on at the time were actually exposed, where the different oligarchs were fighting it out in the British courts about who, who owned what. And you, what comes across very clearly is that no one really, it wasn't really clear who owned what, and people just basically said, oh, this is mine now, got, some, got a group of armed people together and then established it as a fact. And this was the way things worked at that time. And also Yeltsin were also handing, handing out shares left, right and center. Guardian wrote, Yeltsin practically gifted state assets to a small group of well-connected businessmen in return for help rigging the 1996 election. And this was the nature of the new ruling class in Russia. And the workers were paying the price. Real wages were halved. They were owed months and years of back wages unpaid. But obviously over a period of time, these wages were, that they were owed completely diminished in value because of the massive inflation. So struggles started to appear because of this, as well as the wages ahead. And there was a new wave of struggle that developed uh, and they set up workers, were set up salvation committees, they were called, basically Soviets, like workers, organs of power, in uh, around Russia in 1996. Uh, factory occupations, factories being run under workers' control, and this re-emerged again in 1998. And at this time in 1998, a poll showed that 48% preferred socialism to capitalism, and only 27 preferred capitalism to socialism. So uh, you can see that you know, the consciousness has started to catch up with what capitalism really entailed. Yeltsin's support in the opinion polls at this time, 1998, stood at 3%. So there was an election coming up in 2000, no, 1999, but the incumbent had 3%. I think he actually had to stand out anyway, but his support stood at 3%. And at this point, you could actually have reversed the process. The workers were on the streets, they were fighting, they were organizing Soviets and so on. The whole uh, uh, regime was in a crisis, it didn't really have any kind of sense of stability. Um, and the, at that point you could have had a reversal of the process. You could have a workers actually, uh, by generalizing the struggle, by organizing together these committees of action or uh, Soviets, you could have actually had a new worker state emerge and, and you could have rel re relatively easily return, not just to the national plan economy, but actually put the country on the road to socialism. You have workers, a political revolution, overthrowing the bureaucracy and the new oligarchy. Would have been relatively easy. Um, but there was no party really that took up this call. A new party had been formed called the CPRF, so it's the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, which was largely consisted of the old uh, bureaucrats from the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, but there were some other people as well. But in this struggle, they openly defended capitalism or the market reforms. So they didn't really present an alternative. So you have a very, it was a very popular party in Shugan and probably have won a couple of elections, um, but was robbed of it by fraud. Uh, it was a very popular party and because it stood for Com he said it was communist, right? He called itself communist. It stood for something different, supposedly, in name. But in practice, they defended capitalism. And obviously, it created a huge amount of confusion in this movement, which really should have been a movement towards socialism, to abolish capitalism, reverse the market reforms, and introduce workers' control. That should have been on the program, but it wasn't. So this created a huge confusion. I think Shiganov was interested in trying to prove to the West and the Russian oligarchs that he was a safe pair of hands. A bit like, you know, when... Uh, 
cheap gas wrote in the Financial Times they wasn't going to confiscate any state a any private assets and so on. These things, or oh, John McDonald for that matter, did the same thing. And the workers had no alternative. So instead, a new character emerged because of a failure of this movement. A new character emerged, and here we have the P Vladimir Putin emerged on the scene. And he is quite remarkable. If you study his career, it doesn't make any sense. Um, because he was a minor KGB official in Leipzig, yeah? Not a big thing. Uh, and then in 1991, he supposedly resigned from the KGB and he went to work in uh, St. Petersburg, involved in foreign uh, relations. And there, I'm afraid I'm going to go a bit over time here. Uh, he was working in foreign relations and there he managed to invest all $100 million in that, that those days' currency worth of uh, raw materials and products that had been produced in Russia and were exported to the West, supposedly in return for food, but the food never materialized. So basically someone was, was taking the money. Uh, and Putin almost admitted that he had done this in an interview. And he's quite a bracing character. He said, well, look, this was the way things were done at the time. You know, this was the way we did business. Um, um, and this is, uh, um, but that was what he did there. And then this mayor that he was working for got booted out of office in 1996. And in 1997, he went to work for the president, like Yeltsin and his staff. By 1998, he had been put at the head of the FSB, which is the new KGB. They renamed the KGB to FSB, and suddenly Putin was at the head of the FSB. Very strange. By 1999, he was prime minister. Right? So it's a very, you know, it wasn't a minor official in St. Petersburg, but it's quite a meteoric rise. Basically, he never left the KGB. You don't leave the KGB, basically. <laughs> um, so, and this was become quite evident once he became prime minister. Now, still, he is prime minister, but he, no one knows who he is, right? No one really knows who he is. He'd be the head of FSB, no one really knows him. Who's going to vote for him, right? But he was the candidate of the oligarchy. So they needed to do something to boost his popularity. And what happens in September 1999, it was called the, Mos uh, the Russian apartment bombings, where a number of uh, supposedly Islamists bombed a number of apartments in Russia and killed some hundred people or so. Um, but uh, these, there's so many strange things going on about these bombings. Um, one being that the, the, there was a bombing in Moscow, and on the afternoon, of that bombing, the speaker of the Duma, the new, the rebranded the, uh, the Congress, the Duma, like in the SARS days, yeah. So uh, the speaker of the Duma, he announced that there had been a bombing in. Let me get the name right. Where is it? In the bombing in Volgodonsk, yeah. But the bombing of Volgodonsk didn't happen until three days later. Uh, so someone had mixed up the dates. <laughs> yeah. So they gave him a piece of paper with the wrong dates on it, so he announced the wrong dates. Whether he, the speaker himself, who was a member of the Communist Party, by the way, was aware of this, probably not, but still someone was giving him notes and then giving him the wrong dates. Um, uh, there was also an FSB, there was, they found the bomb that hadn't exploded, and the FSB said, oh no, that's our device, it's a part of a training exercise. So there was all kinds of shenanigans going on. Call for an independent inquiry were blocked, and all the supposed perpetrators were killed or sentenced to secret court. So the, the Islamists, they, uh, they, uh, they supposedly did it, were never heard in public. The trials were held in secret, or they were assassinated before or killed before they ever got to court. There was an attempt to an informal inquiry by one of the members of the Duma, but it was stopped by the killing of two of the members of the committee and the arrest of a third of the committee. A witness uh, for the committee, uh, for this inquiry, was defected FSB agent Litvinenko. You remember that, recognize that name? He's the guy who got poisoned with polonium in London in 2008. It was 2008, right? So you can see something, there's something fishy going on with these things, basically. Um, uh, and it's fairly, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of an open secret. But these blasts were a propaganda victory for Putin. And it was show showered with praise from the oligarch-owned press. His popularity skyrocketed. And Yeltsin resigned at the end of the year. And then they, ha they uh, basically put the elections early. So in March, Putin sails to victory and wins the elections in the first round.
still, he didn't have the majority in the Duma. Uh, there, his this, uh, Communist Party, the CPRF, scandalously supported him and gave him a majority. Putin represented the consolidation of the capitalist regime in Russia. Yeltsin wasn't all that more democratic. Now they say, oh, the Yeltsin years were really nice, but they weren't at all. Like, you know, it's quite obvious they weren't fundamentally different. You have still the rule of the oligarchs, and that's what's happening today, and that's what's the take place on the Yeltsin rule. The West quite wrongly assumed that Russia would return as a colony of the West, a bit like happened in Eastern Europe, where all the banks are owned by Western banks and so on. But after the crisis of 1998, Russia emerged on the world arena, hungry to reclaim its spheres of influence. Now, Yeltsin agreed, actually, with some of these. He's often the darling of the West, but actually he didn't have a fundamentally different position on this. He supported, for example, the subjugation of Chechnya, which was one of the key elements when Chechnya that's where the bombings uh, link as well, the conflict in Chechnya. And he also suggested redrawing the borders of the so former Soviet Union republics in Russia's favor. So he didn't, wasn't really fundamentally more like kind of, you know, in favor of the right of self-determination or anything of the sort. Uh, he was just as bad as Putin on that question. Uh, of course, that was it was all in favor of self-determination before the Soviet Union was disbanded. Once the Soviet Union was disbanded, he was against it. Um, so that's how it works. Putin cleared up some of the worst excesses of the Yeltsin years. He imprisoned some of the oligarchs. He broke up their control of the media. Um, in, and then gave it to him and his cronies, himself and his cronies. He stood up to the West as well, saying, you know, we're not going to listen to the IMF and so on anymore, or the US, you know, you can stick it somewhere. Um, and these were all very popular measures that basically increased his popularity at this time, um, because there were, these people were absolutely hated uh, by everyone. And he kind of kept this sort of distance to them, even though he was actually part and parcel of the same regime. The Soviet national anthem was readopted with new lyrics, and Yeltsin was against this actually. He says, You shouldn't be following the whims of the masses, according to Yeltsin. Basically, he admits that the Soviet Union national anthem stood for something different, a different kind of society, and this was quite popular. And Putin always has to do this balance between, you know, a little bit of like, you know, Soviet nostalgia, and uh, on the other hand, basically being a very different regime altogether. Um, the new regime also decided to attempt to forget the Russian Revolution ever took place, so you don't mention it, that's the rule. Instead of uh, Yeltsin, which tried to basically say the Russian Revolution was a tragedy, there was something wrong with it and so on, Yeltsin, Putin's line is, don't talk about it, yeah, <coughs> or uh, very little. And they also had the re economic revival after the crisis of the 1990s. So you have... Uh, a boom in the economy, which developed because of a change in the oil price, it had nothing to do with Putin himself or his policies. But the oil price went from $12 a barrel to 60 and eventually at the height it was at 100 or whatever. And that's obviously made a massive difference to a country like Russia, where 60% of the exports are oil, you know, oil and, a little, and a little bit of gas. So compared to the disaster of the Yeltsin years, seems, things seem to be improving, and that's the course of the Putin's long reign. Uh, uh, as president, well, president and president behind the scenes. Putin also uh, played heavily the external enemy card. So the first was the brutal crushing of the attempt at the independence of Chechnya. He went into Georgia in 2008 and smashed the Georgian army, which was trained and equipped by the Americans. He uh, did defeat. He was involved himself in the civil war in Ukraine, as you probably remember, in 2014. And he was involved in Syria in 2015 and 16. So it's a lot of foreign, basic ventures to try to divert attention from domestic problems. He was a strong man, but this is quite expensive. So the Russian expenses on uh, the Russian military has skyrocketed as a result, and now spending more as a share of their GDP than the United States are, and twice, about twice as much as the UK are spending. What is the nature of a regime like Putin's then? Well, we say, if someone was here for the previous session in this room, the uh, state is armed bodies of men in defense of certain property relations. 
And here it's clear that we're dealing with a state that is defending the private property of the oligarchy. That's the fundamentally what the state is defending. But this wasn't so entirely so clear in the 1990s, because actually the state at that time was more split, particularly in the early 1990s. Uh, so the change, there's a change that's taken place. But it isn't fundamentally different to Yeltsin in other ways. It's ruled by a strong man, use of referendums and plebiscites. There was a recent referendum in Russia, for example, which to sort of overrule um, things and get support for things. Uh, well, for undemocratic maneuvers, uh, trampling over the rights of parliament, and most fundamentally rule by the sword or rule by violence, uh, which you can see ample examples of now in Russia. Putin was more successful at the latter than Yeltsin because the state had stabilized and reconstituted itself. Um, whereas it was in turmoil during the 1990s. So it's different it isn't so much that Yeltsin was you know, against using violence uh, and Putin is in favor. The difference is that Yeltsin had far less ability to use violence, as you could see from when he tried to invade the White House. But we call both of these regimes Bonapartist. The, ted, the deadlock between the classes enabled the state to acquire a certain degree of independence vis-a-vis -vis the ruling class, and balancing between the classes it strikes both blows against both left and right, i.e. both against the workers and the oligarchy. And you can see that in Putin, he would occasionally make a televised appearance where he basically goes to uh, some factory and he denounces the boss for not paying the wages for the workers properly and things like that. Yeah? It doesn't really mean anything very much in the grand scheme of things, but this is the kind of thing that you wouldn't get Boris Johnson doing, for example. Um, if you want to make a comparison. He attacks the oligarchs, but only in order to defend the rule of the oligarchy as a whole. So individual oligarchs will go after, but only to defend the oligarchy as a whole. Putin's popularity is now waning. He used to poll around 60 to 70 percent uh, support, but it's now down to his personal popularity, it's down to 40 percent. And this is also, you should always take opinion polls with a bit of a pinch of salt, but yeah, you can see it. Uh, even these official opinion polls, you can see it tend official, they're not exactly official, but you know, even the opinion polls in Russia, you take a pinch of salt, but you can still see a clear tendency. His use party, United Russia, is doing even worse. Uh, and it's quite interesting to see the figures. If you compare the opinion polls to the election results, you can see a certain trend. So in 2011, um, United Russia got 50% in opinion polls and 50% in the elections. In 2016, they got 40% in opinion polls and 50% in elections. In 2021, so just now in August, they got 30% in opinion polls before the election and then 50% in elections. Uh, you can see a certain, you know, basically what it is, less and less popularity means they have to resort to more and more fraud in order to make up the difference and also uh, more and more violence. Uh, this estimated maybe as much as half of the 28 million votes that United Russia got this time around uh, were fake. There was a mathematician who tried his luck uh, at trying to estimate the amount of fraud, and he said about 14 million votes uh, might be artificial. It is therefore not surprising there's an increasing repression across the board. And the use of force, we should always remember, is a sign of weakness, not of strength. You resort to force, basically, well, generally speaking, because you cannot convince people, right? It's not enough to sort of lie to them in the press and, you know, preach to them from the pulpits or whatever. Uh, it's when you use force when the methods of ideological control or persuasion or whatever you want to call it are insufficient. So when the workers start to move, but you cannot, you cannot hold them back by those means, you have to resort to violence. <laughs> But su suppressing uh, dissent only makes dissent come back again in a stronger and much more vi virulent form. So it is no wonder, I think, and I'm going to end on this, it is no wonder that Vladimir Putin does not want to talk about the Re Russian Revolution because really he is not too stupid. He can see that another revolution just like that one is being prepared for Russia today.